Hello, everyone. Welcome back to what we're going to call season two of our podcast, A Place to Go, where we look behind the scenes at some of the people and projects that are changing public spaces across Canada and in some cases the world. Greetings from Winnipeg. I'm your host, Brennan Fidak. And before we get to our esteemed guest, I'd like to introduce our new co-host, Kirk Hutchinson. Thanks for joining, Kirk. It's glad to have you here. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest today. Her name is Suzanne Quinn. Suzanne is a researcher, a lecturer, an author, and currently the manager of the Compan Play Institute, and in my opinion, an expert on all things regarding play and child development. And I would be hard pressed to find someone to disagree with me. Um, she's a wealth of information and we're happy to have her on. Hi, Suzanne, how are you? Thank you so much for having me today. It's um, good to be with you both. So, manager of the Compan Play Institute. That's an interesting title. How did you get there? Where did you start? Well, many years, of course, of studying and observing children with a focus on play and pedagogy that really gave me the experience that was needed to take in a role like this. The Compan Play Institute itself has been in existence for 25 years. So my colleague, Jeanetta Fish Jesperson, and um, they were looking, you know, as they were expanding North America to have somebody in place in that role in North America. And it just came along at the right time for me to have a career change. Well, not really a career change. I was a tutor professor before I came on board, full-time researcher with Compan. So in many ways, it's very similar to what I was doing before at the university, but now I'm just doing it for Compan. And so the focus is clearly on the outdoor play environment with playground equipment for active play. And then the tutoring part, I do a lot of uh, with landscape architects. So how did I get here? Uh, a pathway through university and child development into this very interesting and very unique role with a company that wants to make sure that what they're making and, and what advice they're giving to landscape architects and playground owners is you know, making the playground the best it possibly can be. Awesome. And you mentioned um, just briefly there a pedagogy and pedagogical study. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit um, for, for our listeners? <laughs> sure. So when we want to enter into a relationship with young children that is helping them to learn their survival skills, so whatever that is in your uh, cultural niche, for many of us in North America, that's, you know, literacy and mathematics and socio-emotional skills and right. uh, Skills to be, you know, a happy, healthy human being who likes to play and move around a lot and make friends. Pedagogical studies are the studies of how we can enter into that relationship. Another word for that would be teaching. <laughs> but I think that pedagogy says a lot more. So that's why I prefer to use that term. And most of my colleagues do. My background is from a historical perspective in Frobelian principles. And Frobel was the founder of kindergartens in what is now Germany, but you know it was a concept that went throughout the world in the late 1800s. And uh, his ideas were about helping young children to be members of the community and recognizing that young children are citizens and then their relationship with nature as number one, and that spiritual connection between nature and a higher and invisible being, as he called it. Really wow. fascinating work. A lot of the work in that time period is very um, revolutionary. He worked with materials and materiality at a time when, you know, our materiality was quite limited. So one of the things that Froebel pioneered was the use of wooden blocks, for lack of a better word. And they were especially designed to show these spiritual relationships between the shapes and then how children could use them. And they were set in a progressive set from, you know, simple to complex and showing these relationships. That's all in part of what my background is and the lens that I look through. That's really exciting. So like that would be kind of in the same vein as like a forest kindergarten, right? Like the outdoor learning environments that yeah. children go to. Um, yeah. In Winnipeg, there's actually an a outdoor school similar to that. And I've always been quite interested in, in that and, and those elements. That's awesome. 
There's a legacy that uh, that is, you know, sort of meshed together with Forest School for Billion Principles. But of course, um, you know, not to leave out, you know, indigenous perspectives on on this kind of being outdoors and the spiritual connection. They're all very, mm. they just come from different cultural perspectives. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting perspective, too. Do you think you've seen that um, that kind of spiritual connection between play and development? Has that it tapered? Kind of nowadays, obviously, you know, indigenous people still have that that connection, but you know, I don't see it as much. You know, from my perspective, a father of two, I have a ten year old and an eight year old, and a lot of what I see is that STEM principles and learning and action reaction and interactive. But I'm wondering, do you still see that connection, or do you have to dig a little further into it? It's it's always a debate, um, you know, in our circles, uh, educational circles, about this this spiritual um, connection and whether or not it's articulated or if it's just something we feel inside. So that kind of curiosity that you get when you're engaging in in scientific discoveries as a young child, you know, that's the you know could be a spiritual spark that's maybe not articulated um that way um but but that being said i do see it happening and i do see a lot of people thinking about it um and and talking about it and um yeah rec- recognizing it especially uh since the pandemic um i've been following you know nature learning groups forest school groups um for a long time but it's really had um, a resurgence in the last year um, with some people that are taking their programs outdoors um, for 100% of the day and when they might not have been outdoors um, before. And so then, you know, in relation to that spiritual connection, a lot of people then, of course, noticing that that is an aspect of, of, of what is happening when they are outdoors, when they think of themselves as people that are outdoors that seek shelter rather than people that are indoors who need to go out. Um, it's a different mindset. Um, so I, th- right. I see that. I see a resurgence in it, I think. So speaking of the pandemic, and you kind of touched on this, how has that, and I guess the nature of your research been affected through this pandemic and, and your research into childhood development? Well, we certainly had to be very flexible and we had to move forward with a sense of optimism in our <laughs> ability, you know, to be able to, you know, not say, oh, we can't do any research now. We said the opposite. We set to, you know, how can we do this given the circumstances? Because it's very important. So how can we continue to make sure that we're consulting with children on our innovations and our playground designs? How can we continue to do observations of children in playgrounds and, you know, pick our research studies very carefully and make sure, of course, we're following all the protocols that should so that we make sure that we're safe. And I think that was really inspirational to me to be part of a team that wanted to move forward and didn't want to be dormant. Yeah, there's definitely a trend of, you know, just shutting down and waiting to see what happens and people being kind of unable to move. So it's it's really exciting to see that, you know, work kept going. <laughs> and that's, yes. that's a, uh, much uh, in the industry of, you know, dry play or, or you know, outdoor public space uh, that, that, you know, people kept marching forward and kept going outside and kept interacting with the spaces. So in the span of like this new style of research, were there any kind of surprises, epiphanies, anything that was really unique that kind of was pulled from that? There's always surprises when you're engaging in research and especially when you're able to do research with children. So once we decided it was safe to do so, we did go back to the field in North America and I did some observational researches using you know, all of the protocols that we possibly could, especially with distancing and being outdoors, which, you know, mm-hmm. you study playgrounds, you're outdoors. So that helps. And, you know, the surprises for me, I think, were just the sense of joy that children have. <laughs> I don't know why that's surprising, because I, I see it all of the time. But I think especially in the pandemic, 
There was a moment in one of the observations days that I had in Austin where I was outside, you know, waiting for the children to come out of the building where they were. And of course, inside the building, they had to keep six feet apart. They didn't have to wear masks. Um, Everything was very different and sedentary for them in the indoors. And when they got to the outdoors, there was one young man who just said, we're free and (laughs) ran to the playground equipment. I could relate to that. And I think that that's been a challenge, I know, for pedagogues, youth workers, teachers, you know, to help children to understand that if at all possible, could they, you know, keep two meters apart? And, you know, I think early on to myself, I thought, oh, this isn't going to go well. But it's okay. I, they get it. We get it, right? And especially if you have really good playground equipment, and I know that we design for social interaction. So a lot of what we're designing for is to keep children face to face and keep children looking at each other and playing with each other. But luckily, you know, some of the things that I was really happy about something, take, for example, the supernova, which, you know, is this huge high capacity spinning structure. You can play with other children on there and still keep two meters apart. It's great. It's almost as if it was built for that very thing. (laughs) Another thing out there on that particular playground is they have a huge octanet climbing structure, very high capacity. And yes, you can play chase on that and not come dangerously close to another person. So I guess maybe that was a surprise too that I was relieved (laughs) about. So speaking of that and and kind of research and observing kids, so I noticed it really with my kids, they had that I'm free kind of experience. And, you know, a lot of times, I mean, even starting from last year at spring break, we would homeschool them. And then whenever we got outside for PE class, it was just night and day. So have you (laughs) noticed that that has affected, I mean, the type of research that you're doing? So take, for example, let's say environmentalists, they had a really unique ability to kind of observe the world in this kind of new microcosm that's never happened before, where everything slowed down, pollution was reduced in certain areas. I saw the example of, um, I think, Venice. They saw dolphins swimming in the water, and it's crystal clear. Have you noticed that similar type of microcosm change, like the attitude of the kids and the way they play and their behaviors change as a result of this freeing aspect of getting outside? Or has it remained the same? I've noticed that there is an effect on children and their desire, you know, to connect with each other that's like articulated more by them. But I've also noticed a lot of really great effort on the part of cities and communities and adults to make, you know, lively streets. So, Uh you know, opening up the street as a place-based, I'm seeing a lot of research coming through, you know, I'm a reviewer, a peer reviewer, on that very topic. So I'm expecting that to be something that we're going to talk about for another couple of years. The researcher, Tim Jill, he's out of the United Kingdom, and um, he just launched a book called Urban Childhoods, or Urban Playgrounds, sorry. And it's about that topic of, you know, rather than sequestering children to spaces that are child-friendly or for children specifically, opening up the city space and making sure that there's lots of pockets for, you know, not only playing, physically playing, active transport, safe feeling on the street, you know, safe as far as your physical safety, but, you know, quieting the traffic so that, you know, you can make use of that street. So I think that we're going to be talking about that because, you know, here is our golden opportunity, right? We know we have a climate emergency know that we have to make changes in our lifestyle. So now we've been sort of pushed in that direction. And um, yeah, so I see a little bit of a change in that with the way that our children are playing, but it it has to do, I think, a lot with the attitudes of adults in that. Right. So yeah, you're kind of talking about field studies and observational studies. Describe what a a nine to five for a Play Institute manager looks like. Like, you know, it sounds like a lot of fun and it sounds like it's really interesting. Yeah, it is very enjoyable. It's challenging work, um, but it's very enjoyable because, of course, the subject area is, you, you know, you're, you're studying people's leisure. So that's always good. The nine to five is not really a nine to five, um, <laughs> especially when Rarely we're engaging. 
Yeah, in a, in a field studies, um, because as you probably know, playground times fluctuate. Um, you have a really a lot of people using the playground ages two to five from about 10 a.m. to noon. Then you have a lull and then you have a lot of people using the playground from about three to five. Those are school age children. And then you have another wave of people using the park and the playground. And this is probably the most interesting time of day. And then this also did, you know, depends on where you are, what the climate is, what the daylight hours are. Mm -hmm. I imagine for you up in Kelowna, your summertime, I mean, you could probably play the playground till midnight, right? (laughs) Yeah, we can push 10 o'clock for sure with sun. Yeah, which is which is amazing. Um, not so much down here in Florida, but you know, you're definitely getting that six to eight. And in some parks, um, here they're grouped together with sports fields. So what you have is, you know, people playing football or baseball, um, lights are on playground is the place where the kids who are not on the, um, you know, on the turf or on the pitch, um, are, you know, spending their time. So, Anyway, that nine to five, when we're in the field study is, is, you know, you've got to be there all day. You're not doing field studies, you know, every day of the work year. So you really need to make the most out of it when you've got that usually two to three week period. Um, So there's that. Um, And then there's, you know, of course, I spend a lot of time um, when I'm not doing, you know, the observations and the writing just reading what other people are, are writing about mm. a broad range of fields. So, you know, uh, I read landscape architecture. I read uh, environmental studies a lot. I read um, uh, geography, human geography. Children's geography is a niche within, within geography. Um, so this is, you know, like a health, um, nursing, family studies, all <laughs> contribute to what we might get our ideas about and where is the context that this research would fit. Of course, for Compan then, you know, how we can make our products better and then how how are we talking about them? And then how, the, how can we ensure um, that everybody wants them and everybody can get them too? I mean, there's a, a whole other side of the research that's related to equity and public funding as well. Mm. Always got my mind on that um, too. Right how can we encourage people that it's worth their while to make this investment in Mm. place? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just kind of, you know, so diverse. There's so many factors at play when it comes to these, you know, outdoor public spaces and, you know, COVID we've talked a lot about that. That's thrown everything, you know, for a loop. And yeah, there's just, it's amazing. You must be the sieve for information (laughs) at this point. Yeah. So it's a lot. Yeah. But it's good. So how do you decide on that? Is it, uh, you know, specifically with your work with Compan, obviously it's very research-based and, you know, you talked about your on-site research. Do you go into these with very specific things that you're looking for? Is it more product-driven to say, is this going to work in the field? Or is it purely observation? We're just going to look and wait for things to happen to give us ideas. And It's a little bit of everything. So we do have product testing and that happens in Denmark. And I am a part of that but not in person anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And that's ongoing. And that's, you know, their nine to five is very intensely related to, you know, the schedule of, you know, testing the innovations and then perturbing the process and then testing some more and then, you know, making decisions before things go to production. That's very product focused, child focused, how the children respond, but also the safety so you can have you know a lot of ideas about what you would want to do on a playground, but it's got to be free of hazards. And you know we have these standards which are are very beneficial for people. Then how do you work with the materials to meet the standards so that the play is thrilling? So there's that. But once we go out post occupancy, which I would say I'm more involved in that side of things, we want to know how long children will play on different pieces of equipment because the academic research doesn't touch that. It doesn't touch it at all. Academics go out and do post-occupancy studies and they'll cordon off a section of a playground and, hey, maybe it contains a spinner, but maybe it contains a slide. How long Mm -hmm. 
play on the slide and the spinner, I don't know, because they only measure in a certain way. So they don't. So we need baseline and diverse information on that so that we can, well, I mean, it really assists us in giving advice to people who want to buy this equipment. What's the capacity and how long will children play? And will they play actively or will they just sit and be sedentary? So that's really been our focus. And we're always focused on the active play. So how can we make something active? And I think some of the really impressive work that, you know, I'm proud to say that we've done is, you know, taking something that would ordinarily be sedentary, such as sand and water play, not that what not water play is not sedentary, but water when you're touching it with your hands, right? Mm, right. And then looking at how do you enhance that environment so that children will move their bodies around more when they're engaging with that tactile material. And I think we've hit it really well. And um, I think it's great. And especially, you know, water, you know, which I'm not involved in the big movement water um, research, but I'm often you know, observing children at splash pads and in these spaces, especially here in Florida. <laughs> what a lifesaver it is for communities to right. be able to help their kids and their parents cool down, you know, in ways that are environmentally friendly and that, um, you know, they're not defunct. You know, they're, mm-hmm. the swimming pool is great. I love swimming. I think it's so important. But, you know, you're only using the swimming for a certain amount of time and you're because of how much exertion you have to do when you're swimming, you're you're doing it in bursts. Whereas when you're at a splash pad, you're running around, you're cooling off, you're filling things up and pouring things out. It's just it's fantastic. And remove some of those barriers, too, with, you know, depth and standing water. Yeah, yeah. Well, and not only barriers when it comes to the actual physical space, but access to the space for something like that. Like splash pads are, you know, usually an open space accessible by anybody at any time, right? Yeah. So, Suzanne, how did how did you play as a kid? Like, does that inform, you know, what you're researching or what you're keying in on or like how your kids have been play? you, you know, how they played as children like when they were younger and those kinds of things? Mom walking yeah. around the clipboard when your kids are at the park. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all of my children now are adults, so I sometimes will bring them along when we do observations. Um, but uh, and when they were younger, and this was before I, I had dedicated myself to the research of, of spaces. Um, yeah, we used to love to survey playgrounds in different places, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think that how you play as a child affects all of us as adults and hopefully how that's nurtured. And of course it has to do with the eco-cultural niche that you grew up in. And Mm -hmm. I'm lucky enough to have a broad range of experiences. I grew up in a large metropolis area in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I think it's so important for us to invest as communities in these spaces that children Mm -hmm. will welcome um, and also, you know, on the topic of inclusion, you know, socially inclusive, but inclusive of persons of a range of abilities and, and a ability to access the space is so important. Um, just, you know, where we share this existence with each other, we should make it a good one. We, we certainly can. <laughs> so speaking of inclusivity, obviously that's extremely important and it's kind of, it's a hot topic, but uh, it's not hot as it new. It's been around forever. You said you grew up in kind of these different areas, your urban municipality, which likely had little pocket parks. And then obviously the population, New Haven of a thousand, which probably had a lot of open spaces. What are some simple ways that people can create these barrier-free um, and equitable spaces that are truly inclusive and, and kind of go beyond that inclusivity of just providing, you know, I think of a, a spray park instead of providing one um, accessible bathroom, because that's what code says. Why not do two or three? Like, wh- what are some easy ways that municipalities can achieve this barrier-free play in a yeah. certain form? Well, I think selecting universally designed pieces of equipment is going to get you a lot of mileage. And, you know, I just think in terms of Compan, we have, we're always designing with universal design in mind, but some pieces just really get it right. So what you're looking for is something that everybody will want to play with, but that is easy for a person if they use an assistive device or if they have a caregiver 
to transfer them into the piece of equipment. And, you know, some examples are a basket swing is a very universally designed piece of equipment that is such a hit. Such mm. a hit. Everybody. Or these carousel spinners that, you know, have an open design that you can get on it in different ways. So you don't have to stand up on it, but you could. You don't have to hang your arms off it, but you could. You know, so I think that that gives you a lot of mileage. That's a simple way. But it, it isn't a simple problem, especially as, you know, communities get more complex and overlap each other. So in a place like New Haven, West Virginia, I'm not kidding you. Everybody knows each other. You know, so if there is a person who uses a wheelchair, they know it and they're going to make right. sure that that person, you know, has the things that they need. But in a place like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where maybe you belong to one borough, but maybe you use services in another and then maybe there are people coming in from another. It's difficult because you don't all know each other. So you have to become a little bit more proactive in, in your community engagement. And that's always a good thing. We don't always hit that target as citizens, but I think that that's the way to do it is just really make sure you find out what people need, what they want, mm-hmm. and feel safe in environments. <laughs> when you mention uh, a town where everybody knows each other, I, I was going to mention, you know, I, I grew up in a rural town, uh, half the size of New Haven, West Virginia, <laughs> 500 <laughs> people. Um, and I was I was thinking to the play that, that I experienced, you know, in, in that community where maybe there wasn't tons of infrastructure and there was a lot more like open-ended play, right? There's, you know, kind of more inventive, maybe. And again, I didn't grow up in an urban center, so I don't know, but that's a really interesting perspective is, you know, the infrastructure can kind of define the kind of play experiences that you get. Um, and and planning for, you know, all the groups is a lot easier when you know everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You touched on this a little bit um, previously about some of the research that you're really proud of, but is there like, what's some of the work that you are, you know, the absolute proudest of in your time with Compan? I'm, I'm interested to hear if you've got a response for that yeah. or if it's everything. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm really proud of, of every, everything that we do. I think it's hard to see, you know, the value of what it is that you do, your part mm. of the company, you know? What I'm more you know, proud of is when I drive by a playground that I never knew existed, I just did it yesterday with my mother, again, out in a very rural area of Florida. And we were just looking at you know, what was around in the area, just take a little short drive. And right behind where she lives, there's a school that I used to work with when I worked in Florida at the university here. And I, I said, that's a compound playground because <laughs> you, know, you, you can recognize it, you know, right away. And then I just said to her, how did they get one out of here? Yeah. I just like, that's great. I think that that's fantastic. So that's more like of a pride thing. And then, of course, you know, whenever something comes out in the media and it's, you know, not something that we expected to happen, um, I think it was like the 50 most coolest places for kids came out and there was one of our playgrounds. I think maybe two of our playgrounds were on the list. And I was just like, you know, that's, that makes me feel proud. Um, It's a group effort. So I think um, it's in, you know, from the people that do the innovative designs and, and all of the safety to, you know, the people who make sure that a rural community and, uh, Zephyr Hills, Florida gets a compound playground. Is <laughs> it's pretty rewarding when you can see your efforts come to fruition and the result is smiling people. Like that's yeah. that's a pretty unique experience for sure. So how did you take this research that you're always engaging in and how do you, I guess, apply that in a practical sense, knowing that, you know, you just mentioned that community input is really important. Are you seeing kind of a, an influx in a lot of projects that you work on in your research with community input, or do you kind of take your research and then apply it from there? How do you kind of make that, that leap to this is what I know, and this is kind of, I can't say recommendations, but this is what we know will work, and how do you kind of bring that community into it so that it has a positive impact on the end result and these playgrounds that are getting put in the ground? Because I've seen, you know, sometimes it can be a challenge, you know, the more voices you have, the more difficult it becomes to reach that end goal. Well, I say... When you're working for a company, as I do for Compan, you know, and we're laser focused on this 
you know, one aspect. And so these are our values and this is what we're focused on. We're always just trying to pay attention to, okay, let's find out what makes the products better, but then let's also find out how that matters to the people that are going to be making the decisions. Um, So it's super applied research. Whereas when you're at university, it's more, well, for me anyway, there are a lot of different approaches to research at uh, university researchers. It's more about, you know, well, what are the broader issues in society? And then how can we take a slice of this and understand it a little bit better? So this is more applied right from the get-go. So it starts from, you know, research questions that are really related to the end user, the children, um, Mm. but also the people that are going to make the decisions for the end user. So there's that. And we produce white papers that, you know, we make decisions about what is going to be, you know, a topic of a white paper based on what we see trending in the industry and then more broadly. But there's a lot of micro research that is, again, super applied. So if there is a big project and, you know, the sales consultant that's working with the customer will say, well, we want to know about this, which is the best thing to pick for this or, you know, how does this compare to this? And our budget is this, and we need you know, to fit it with that. So there's a, a lot of very um, specific research that we do that is completely practical, bespoke to that project. Right. It'll be a little easier to translate over then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess you, you briefly touched on these white papers that Compan has been publishing and that the Play Institute has been publishing. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what those white papers are and what their kind of end goal is? Yeah, the white papers we have on a range of topics, I think some of the most popular ones are about inclusive play. So we have a, a play for all and we have one called truly inclusive. That is based on research that we've done in consultation with children and their pedagogues and parents as well on, you know, what is good for these children. And then also some desk research on what are the experiences of persons with disabilities. So that's a strong component of our white paper offer. We always want to make the most out of the research that we've done at innovation phase with, you know, when a product launches as well. So for Mm -hmm. example, we have a a line of products launched this year on sensory play, which is a really important topic, is a part of the suite of universally designed products that are really attractive to persons who may focus their play on sensory types of activities and the visual and the tactile and also body pressure. So of course, we have a white paper associated with that and that's about to launch soon. So that's you know, in its final stages, and we're going to be putting that out soon. But we also tackle topics such as language development on playgrounds, of course, compared Mm -hmm. with playgrounds and not on playgrounds. Physical activity, we've done studies of, you know, how many calories you burn on a playground typically. So that forms the bulk. And we do have a nice curated collection of research papers and the end goal of them is to make them easily digestible. Mm. Big learning curve for me. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I am used to, you know, the last thing I published before, well, I mean, I still continue to do so, but the last book that I was involved with is 35 chapters, you know, (laughs) every micro detail of every, you know, it was on international perspectives in early childhood. So, you know, perspectives from a range of countries. And so I, you know, I'm used to writing with a lot of detail. So for every white paper, there is a 20 page paper behind. (laughs) But, you know, of course, we don't want to bog people down with that. We act as a resource. And if a person wants to know more, then that's where my micro um, bespoke research can come in. Yeah. I can't imagine the, uh, arduous and heartbreaking process of editing a 20 page document down to, I believe those white papers are one or two pages, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The crux actually, of the world appreciate. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? I appreciate it now. I'm, you know, getting to the point in my life where I get it. I feel like, you know, your time is precious. So a lot of it is about credibility. Do you trust the author? Do you trust the source? Mm. Can you critique it yourself and put it into the context of of what it can do for you? 
And so if you can do that in two pages, then you've done very well. Or explain your life's work in 30 minutes on a podcast, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, about those white papers, and you talked about it, this more of a sensory play direction in terms of what Compound is producing and developing a white paper for that. And we talked a little bit about inclusion as well. So other than that, are there any other design trends or play trends that you foresee or anything that you can kind of divine based on your research so far? So I'm really interested talking way into the future. You know, if we colonize Mars, what are the playgrounds going to be like there? (laughs) I saw the architectural proposal, I think, in the AIA Digest a few weeks ago, or it might have been Metropolis Magazine. They were building like sort of underhill house with like all these portals to the outside where you could just see the outside. And I thought, where is the play going to be there? You wouldn't need surfacing. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I I don't even know. So that's into the future. And I mean, certainly that's the distant future. That's at least 60 or 70 years. But it won't be long. I also just read that we will have a space station station leisure facility, you know, hotel. It's set to open in 2027. I somehow thought to myself, that's not too long from now. Yeah, wow. But bringing it a little bit back down to (laughs) Earth, I would say the most tangible trend occurring now and will carry us into the next five years is nature play. And I'm a big fan of problematizing what does this mean, nature play. And we've done several webinars. I've done several conference presentations on this topic. It always gets a, a lot of really good dialogue around it. Because, of course, when you're, you're talking about design and materiality, a lot of times a customer would probably say, you know, okay, that means I want a wood playground. Or it means I don't want any equipment. <laughs> I just right. some boulders and we'll call that a day. And I'm very much an advocate based on the research, you know, that we've done at Compan, but also the academic research and this relationship between children's activity and being in the outdoors. I'm very much a proponent of supplying structures for children to play actively and not necessarily wood, although wood is beautiful and it may fit your environment, but I wouldn't rule out working with ropes and working with steel sensitively and lightly, not, you know. Mm steel cages or anything like (laughs) structures that provide enough transparency that you can see the environment that's around you. Because of course, it's going to be super important for us to continue to think about, you know, cradle to cradle lifespan of these structures that we invest in. And, you know, what is the lifespan of that wood? Is that wood ethically sourced? And, you know, the same with the steel and then whatever it's treated with. So I see that trending, nature play, but questioning, what does this mean? And that's where I see we have a lot of influence as a play institute in distilling all that research, but then also bringing it to, you know, some design strategy suggestions that will work for people. So how do you tread that line? I've seen a lot of this nature playgrounds and you're right, it's pretty all encompassing. It could mean a couple of boulders and it could mean a wooden structure or something that is not made of wood at all, but aesthetically it looks kind of like something that you would find in nature. How do you tread that line to provide a community with something that's functional, beautiful, still has that nature play? You know, I'm thinking of the Compan Playground in Tofino, British Columbia, which is fantastic. And it's in this community park. It's stunning. It's obviously outdoors. And they do a pretty good job. It's a lot of... um, Brendan, you might remember it's these basically tipped over logs. So there's all these kind of like almost like an adventure course. But then they have a traditional playground element to it. But it mm-hmm. seems to me that it would be a difficult balance because you have some coming from the camp that it has to be, let's put our kids in the bush and let it run versus, <laughs> no, we need a functional playground. How do you kind of balance that? Yeah, I mean, I think actually Brendan probably knows better because <laughs> you're dealing with the customer. I could give you the research behind it. Yeah, please. So, for example, there is a lot of research that tries to tries to compare the amount of physical activity that children would get in an open field or uh, non-built environment with the amount of physical activity that they would get if there were some structures supplied, right? It's very difficult to make conclusions 
from that, I would say I'm fairly confident that you get more exercise when there's structures. But I'm not, you know, 1000% confident that we've considered all of the factors and all of the scenarios, you know. So if you're in New York City, in, you know, the center of Manhattan, it's very different than being in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, more dense and, you know, the kinds of activities that people engage in and the way that they feel environments is, is so much heavier in Manhattan than it is in British Columbia. How do you convince the community of what is going to be good for them? I mean, I don't know, Brennan, you have some ideas? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it comes down to what the community has as a priority. If their priority is simply to provide a place for children to play, then the materiality and maybe the context or the sites, that's not super important. They want to, you know, check the boxes of we need to provide swinging, we need to provide sliding, these kinds of things. But when there's a community group that's, you know, willing to open up their process to consult, to explore new ideas, if there's a interesting site that's maybe in a densely wooded area, then, you know, maybe that lends itself more to these nature playgrounds. Or I believe, you know, there's a place for every kind of playground and that consultation process, just like you mentioned with community involvement, like that's really getting to know what a client or a community group or an architect, what they hold as important. And then you kind of provide a solution based on that. Because, you know, there's a wide compound and many play providers, there's a wide, wide palette of things that can mm. be pulled from. So it's definitely open-ended, but it's part of a discussion and discourse. It's never you know, I have a solution, here's my solution, and we're done. It's always, you know, a back and forth. We do have one more question for you. Extremely important. This could change play as we know it based on your response. So you should <laughs> feel the weight of your fist on your shoulders. Would you rather know the history of every object you've touched or be able to talk to animals? I love this question. It's really difficult to decide, of course. My first reaction to a question like this is, I already feel like I talk to animals pretty well. I'm okay with it. I maybe don't need to know more from Hector, my canine companion, or Buster and Minnie, my feline companions, or Jockin, the alligator in my backyard. I don't really want to talk to him. When I, when I go out in the garden and I see him, I'm mostly just trying to get vibe him away. So he's just your cranky roommate that uh, lives in the back? Yeah, I mean, he's more sort of ominous and threatening than cranky. And right now it's mating season, so... Oh, boy. Yeah, he growls, and it's I've never really heard anything like that before. I don't know. I feel like I communicate with animals to a satisfactory degree, although there could always be room for improvement. But I am fascinated by the history of objects and just even a consciousness of what objects I actually have touched. There's a lot of objects in our visual fields that we don't touch. And I was just thinking to myself as, you know, I'm indoors a lot more now than I'd like to be. As I look at things outside my window, which are mostly naturalized things, but I've never really touched them. So that's fascinating. But as far as the history of the objects, I find that that would be an interesting pursuit you know, obviously I've touched a lot of doorknobs and I lived in London for 10 years, London and England. You know, I grabbed on a lot of posts on the bus and on the train and I've stepped on a lot of surfaces. I bet you concrete is probably the most touched object in my life. But I do wonder, you know, where does it come from? Who are mm -hmm. people that are involved in the production of it? And as we move forward in our climate emergency, I'm becoming more and more interested in, you know, as we spoke up before, you know, the cradle of the cradle experience of materials that are in our lives. And just, you know, of course, this applies to playgrounds. And this isn't my area of playground expertise, but it's everybody's area of concern. So, yeah, I think that's fascinating. How about you yeah. all? Do you know what you would rather do? Well, mine is not as in depth as yours. I just really want my dog to listen to me. So I'm going with animals. Yeah. <laughs> we talked a little bit about Frobel and Frobel's gifts, right? Yeah. Like, what if you got your hands on something like that? What kind of stories could you tell with that? Um, yeah. Which I well, thought 
I've been lucky enough. So I worked at Froebel College in London. And so these were educators that were trained by him and then came and started this college. Um, wow. You have artifacts. We can't say they were touched by Froebel, but they were touched by the people that, you know, he trained. But also an interesting related to that, there's a, a remarkable woman and she has passed on just a little less than a decade ago. Her name is Eleanor Goldschmidt. She pioneered the concept related to heuristic play, you know, play with objects, called treasure basket. And a treasure basket is a basket that you create for your newborn child out of everyday objects so that the child can, you know, feel and touch and get acquainted with the world. And it's just a moving concept and it, it's really lovely. When Eleanor passed, our archive obtained her personal treasure basket. Wow. And so, yeah, this was a really big deal for us at the Froebel Archive and also for the college because then we could, you know, bring it to students and that, you know, they could actually touch what Eleanor touched when she came up with this idea of the treasure basket. So, yeah, I think that there are so many interesting, curious, playful pursuits in that idea of a history of objects. Yeah, no, I... To answer the question, I, you know, I don't have alligators here, so I might, you know, lean a little bit more towards the animal part of things. Again, in a rural area, I'd love to know what my cows think of me. <laughs> but no, I think the objects would be a, a much cooler. That'd be just, I, I love having bits of information. So I'd, I'd always have something in store if I just pick up something, <laughs> have a story yeah. ready to go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for chatting with us. There's obviously a wide field of research related to you know not only kids at play but you know the world as a whole the environmental crisis and cradle to cradle is an awesome concept and many people are familiar but if you're not feel free to look it up plenty of information about that and you know we're learning you know we learn that play is a little bit a little bit more complex than just playing grounders on a playground so i appreciate the educative process this podcast is brought to you by the play experts at Playworks and RecTech Industries, where we share a combination of 60 plus years of experience. Check us out on social media if you'd like to learn more about what we do. And if you have any questions, comments, feedbacks, or criticisms, email us at info at playworks.ca. Thank you for listening. And thanks for being with us, Suzanne. Thank, Thank you. you.